Jaun Andreok, Arratzaldeon, Dizuela, Guztio, Iune Batetik Bestera, Eskenat. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. We're going to be holding the 10th interview in a few minutes, and this 10th uh, edition uh, will then be over. This 10th uh, edition of uh, literature with two uh, prestigious uh, uh, screenwriters, and I say two because finally Jean-Claude Carrier has been unable to visit us for uh, health reasons, and uh, we hope that he uh, recovers very soon. But in any case, the festival is not going to end with these uh, two uh, events, from uh, literature uh, to uh, cinema. And we are going to uh, also have uh, two uh, films, The uh, Discreet Charm of Bourgeoisie and The uh, Burning Plan tomorrow. And you're invited to uh, attend. And over the next uh, week, uh, we will be holding the rest of these events. Uh, but uh, so far, the stock taking we can take uh, from this uh, stage is that there has been an exceptional turnout because for seven days, this auditorium has been uh, practically full every day, including this uh, final evening. And uh, because of that, uh, to uh, all uh, the readers and speakers, uh, Thank you very much uh, for all your support. Uh, once again, you deserve a round of applause. I would like to thank you and uh, the support uh, from the uh, Bilbao Town Council, the French Institute, uh, the uh, Association of uh, Bilbao Booksellers, uh, and it's a pleasure to have been able to have uh, all this participation, which gives us even greater strength uh, to prepare the 11th uh, edition next year, which is already underway. But uh, we will be able to uh, discuss this during the Reader's Hour at 9 o'clock, which will be held at the usual uh, place. Uh, we'll offer you a glass of uh, wine. We know that uh, tomorrow is almost a Monday, but uh, we hope that the uh, evening won't run on uh, too long. And without further ado, uh, the uh, introductions, Guillermo Arriaga. He's worked on uh, works such as uh, uh, Amores Perros, 21 Grams, and Babel. And uh, Mithil Gastambige uh, is also here, who, among other titles, has Box uh, 507 and uh, uh, No Peace for the Wicked. And before starting the interview, uh, we will have uh, music as uh, usual from uh, Inun with uh, Giorgio Gorospe, and he's going to offer the song uh, Karin with uh, the lyrics by John Arano. So uh, let's uh, welcome them with a strong round of applause.
Buenas tardes. Muchísimas gracias por venir. Good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you for filling the room. We feel a little bit orphaned without the presence of Jean-Claude Carriet. We will try uh, to uh, bring up his work during the uh, talk, but uh, Guillermo is here, who is more than enough to fill everything. Joseba earlier uh, explained uh, some of his work, his novels, uh, The Savage has just uh, come out, uh, The Guillotine Squadron was the first, uh, The Sweet Taste of Death, The Night Buffalo, and then uh, his uh, unforgettable films, 21 Grams, uh, Amores Perros, The uh, Knights of Melquiades Estrada, and what was uh, Lejos de la Tierra Quemada in Spanish, etc. So, uh, to uh, start up, I would like to ask whether there was any difference between the Guillermo Arriaga that wrote uh, books and uh, the uh, scriptwriter or screenplays. Well, first of all, thank you very much uh, for the uh, invitation to Gutun Suria, Clara, Lourdes, Marisa, Alasne. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful to be here, and uh, especially thanks to you. I know that 50% uh, uh, of you came to listen to Carrier. I hope I'll be able to make up for his absence. It's a pity. Mr. Carrier has uh, left me alone with the audience, but anyway. I started as a novelist. As a child, I wanted to do several things. I wanted to be a world champion. I wanted to uh, win the NBA championship but I also wanted to uh, win the Oscar, Kant, and the Nobel Prize. And I remember that when uh, they were handing over the uh, Nobel Prize, I would pick up a Coca-Cola uh, and thank uh, my uh, parents and uh, my uh, siblings for their support. So I've been training for a long time. I always wanted to be a writer and uh, a footballer. I tried to be a professional footballer, but uh, I wasn't good enough. And at some time, I forgot about writing. I felt that uh, uh, writing wasn't as important as uh, creating a better uh, Mexico. I started to get interested in politics. I started to get interested in revolutionary processes. And that's uh, what I was uh, working on when my heart got infected. Among these uh, crazy things, I wanted to go to the Olympic Games because uh, the uh, chap I rented a flat with wanted to go to the Olympic Games. Uh, and uh, I thought, well, what can I do in a sport? I'll be a boxer. I used to uh, fight on the street every day. That's why my face looks like this. And uh, my heart got infected while I was training. 
and I've had a slight infection. It's called pericarditis. Uh, it's not a major problem, but if you don't go uh, to bed immediately, your heart uh, swells. My uh, myocardium uh, got inflamed, and this was the inspiration for 21 grams. And in bed, I uh, reconsidered things because I was in bed for three months. I reconsidered what I wanted to be, and I said, I want to be a writer. I looked at my hands, and I said, uh, probably uh, tonight... Uh, my hands uh, will turn into uh, the uh, hands of a corpse because uh, all of our hands will turn into a corpse someday. And uh, I asked, what have I done with these hands? Have I uh, caressed uh, all the skin I should have caressed? Have I built anything? And I started uh, to write uh, uh, like mad from there on every day without... Uh, uh, mattering uh, whether it was a holiday or not, whether it was a Sunday or not, whether I was coming back from a party or not. I wrote uh, every day. I wrote several books, and uh, I sent them to the publisher, and I sent them in for competitions, but nothing happened. But that didn't uh, discourage me. I felt that uh, writing was different to publishing. What I'd like to do was to tell stories, and I tried to do the best uh, possible job because somehow by telling stories, uh, this was a fight against death. Because uh, uh, it was close, my heart got infected again. So I started to write uh, books. I wrote uh, a storybook uh, called Return 101, which I wrote between uh, 23 and 26 years of age. And then I wrote uh, two or three uh, storybooks after that. I wrote The Guillotine Squadron, and I wrote uh, The Night uh, Buffalo. And the uh, rights uh, for Guillotine Squadron and Sweet Smell of Death were bought. And one of uh, the people that bought it said, could you uh, write for the cinema? And I very daringly said, yes, of course. Uh, how difficult can it be to write for the cinema? And uh, I wrote a film. I was paid for it. The Maximum Film Institute uh, paid me to do whatever I wanted. And I wrote the first film that was called uh, A Cielo Abierto, which was the initial film of the trilogy. I had written A Cielo Abierto, uh, Amores Perros, uh, White Dog and Black Dog, and 21 Grams, uh, which I wanted to direct. That was my aim. So I wrote this, and uh, from there I started to be on both uh, sides, uh, in uh, the movies and in literature. Well, novels, I won't say literature, and I'll explain why later. My uh, latest uh, work is uh, The Savage. It took me five and a half years. And by the way, there are people uh, that tell me I read it in three days. Five uh, and a half years, sitting down 18 hours a day. I put on 14 kilos in weight. Uh, my uh, uh, back uh, collapsed, and then uh, people uh, read it in uh, three days. Yes, and based on real events that never happened, yes. But a friend said, if you put together the three days from this reader with the three days from that reader and that other reader, maybe you'll uh, add up to five and a half years. And uh, dear audience, I'm counting on your three days. Uh, the book is on sale outside. And in the process of writing novels, they didn't uh, all work out. I wrote a novel about a tramp surrounded by dogs, and I was working on it, but uh, something wasn't working. And I was writing a novel that uh, started, so this is death. These uh, tubes they're putting into my body, that uh, time on the clock, is this death? Who's going to die first? The uh, person to my left, the woman over here, which of us is going to die first? And if anybody's seen 21 Grams, that's Sean Penn's monologue uh, in the hospital. So uh, however much I wanted to move forward, nothing happened. But I feel that some uh, stories have uh, a life uh, beyond life. Some stories uh, refuse to die and uh, they struggle to uh, come out in a different way. And these stories came out, uh, these stories which were novels, came out as films. And at some point I had to decide whether The Savage was going to be a novel or a film. And I very quickly uh, decided to make it a novel. Is there any reason? 
something that uh, made you think that this was more uh, of a novel than a film. I think that uh, the point of view is fundamental. The point of view and the narrative. Movies, in spite of uh, the uh, off voice, is always uh, a third person. It's uh, always uh, voyeuristic. You always have to see it in pictures. However, in the novel, you can get involved in what the uh, person is thinking. It's more in the first person, even if you're in the third person, but a first person is implied. But for me, in both cases, it's literature. When somebody uh, tells me that uh, I'm writing for movies, uh, when I'm going to go back to literature, I even feel offended because a th playwright is never asked when you're going to go back to uh, literature. However, a screenwriter, it's uh, as if uh, we were doing a minor job and we are the only uh, medium of them all where the original writer, the original author of the story, isn't the author of the film. You never say Romeo and Juliet by Feliciano Martinez, uh, who directed it. You say uh, the uh, Raquel Anaya's uh, Fifth Symphony. But in movies, you do. The author of the original idea, of the original story, becomes diluted and it's taken up by the director. Do you think uh, this year uh, Bob Dylan uh, has won the uh, Nobel Prize for Literature. Do you think that uh, should happen in the future? Sh should, could a screenwriter win one? It should happen. Uh, Charlie Kaufman, for example, or David Mamet, or Sam Shepard. I think uh, it should also happen. And that's your uh, difference. You talk about um, screenwriters uh, and writers. Well, uh, screenwriter is a derogatory term. Uh, and we were discussing it during lunch. When does a personal work become a guide for somebody else to do the real work? It's true uh, there are writers uh, that uh, work on commission. The director says, this is my idea, I want you to do this and go there. But uh, there are writers that don't. There are writers that write a personally, uh, personal original work that nobody pays for in advance. And we agree with the director, do you want to film this story? Here it is. Give me your notes, but the real author of the story, at least, uh, is the writer. I don't mean to say that he's the author of the film. I don't want there to be any mistakes in this, but I don't think it's fair. If somebody presents a personal story where uh, you can see your f fingerprints, the uh, writer uh, shouldn't say it's only his film. If the director gave the writer ideas, and uh, the writer uh, followed uh, the guidance of the director, then he is working for the director. But there are uh, writers that work with a director, not for a director. Jean-Claude is also a director that has worked uh, with, uh, hardly ever with uh, original stories. In his discourse, he has an idea, which is apparently very different to yours, where uh, the script disappears. It disappears during the process. Uh, the script is the infancy of the film, but as soon as the other processes comes in, uh, the uh, script uh, vanishes. This uh, idea of the uh, script uh, thrown into the waste paper basket uh, and somehow recovered during the editing. Do you think that it also happens uh, la that way at times? I think it happens at times, especially when you're working on commission, when you're working at the service of a film and a very particular view. But if you're not working at the service of, uh, you needn't disappear. And uh, people uh, recognize uh, a movie because it's a Charlie Kaufman uh, movie, whoever directs it. Why would his uh, uh, name disappear when he has a, a deep personality and a deep uh, print? And I disagree with those who say that he should disappear. I don't think Charlie Kaufman disappears. Sam Shepard doesn't disappear. No, he doesn't refer so much to the scriptwriter. And he says that the uh, movie, history books, etc., and Jean-Claude Carrier is God. We all know the films he's made, and uh, uh, his value is recognized. But the script as such, as an object, as a narrative element, disappears, that the written literary work, uh, the uh, film work, uh, makes everything else disappears. And this is what some other authors say, as we spoke before about uh, Tarantino. The uh, latest uh, uh, script version is uh, the latest editing version. And this uh, coincides uh, somewhat with your opinion. 
Well, uh, an actor uh, once told me that uh, a film was written uh, three times, when it was written, when it was filmed, and when it was edited, and I found that offensive. And uh, I said, uh, well, um, you uh, also uh, do it three times, when you rehearse, when you fill it, and uh, when we see your ass in the poor version you made. So a film is written twice, period. And this uh, leads uh, to a film, but it's written once. And if it isn't written, Yes, it's written a hundred times or rewritten. But once it's ready, that's a work that uh, can be of value in itself. I would like uh, to go back uh, to Amores Perros, uh, 21 grams, because there's an origin to those stories in your mind. Something happened that made you think about those stories and to uh, focus on them. Could you uh, tell us the original uh, process, uh, uh, why the accidents in those films are... Uh, so important and how this occurred in your mind. In 1985, at 6.17 uh, in the morning, uh, we were in uh, my uh, van in a very mountainous uh, area. There were four adults and three children and a dog. And uh, I was lying down without a belt. Uh, we'd traveled all night and I decided to lie down. I couldn't uh, put my seatbelt on because I wanted to sleep. I wanted to rest. Uh, underneath me was a very uh, small uh, child that uh, fed on the floor. The uh, other two and uh, the children in the back. And the guy that was driving turned around uh, to wake up this other guy to drive. But by doing this, uh, he lost sight of the road, which was full of bends and uh, crashed against a wall. And uh, to avoid the wall, he turned the wheel and uh, we uh, dropped into a ravine. I woke up feeling that we were dropping. It was a 12 meter drop. My uh, face hit a rock, which also explains uh, my face. Uh, this isn't I'm bald, it's uh, the rock scratched it off. And I woke up in the middle of the accident and I said, I can't die, I can't die. I curled up because my first thought was we're going to be killed. It's horrible to wake up with the noise of metal buckling and the windows bursting and the vegetation. It's uh, like a jungle out there and all the plants started to come in through the broken windows. And we got out. I lost my nose. All these bones are from my ballot. It uh, went into my uh, brain. I was covered with uh, blood. I fractured my cheekbones. I climbed up the 12 meters uh, to get uh, back on the road. And uh, in fact, uh, I never uh, wrote a graphic uh, vision of uh, how the accident was. And uh, I suffered uh, insomnia, not insomnia, amnesia. This, this amnesia is due to uh, last night's insomnia. And I wondered what happened before the accident, during the accident, and after the accident. And that was uh, the structure uh, for uh, Amores Perros. And I wrote uh, this trilogy, Open Sky, Dog Love and 21 Grams after that accident that occurred. And what I wanted to do was to uh, use uh, uh, novel structures, absolutely literary uh, structures, uh, to the uh, structure of moving making, inspired on The Sound of Fury by William Faulkner. And that is what I tried to do, to uh, give uh, this uh, nuance uh, of a novel. And that's why uh, people say that my uh, work is uh, very much influenced by uh, cinema. No, the other way around. Uh, cinema is influenced by my novels. And uh, do you think the opposite is also happening, that uh, movies are influencing a lot of the novels that are being written? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think that there has always been novel writing where the uh, visual carries specific weight. The Bible, if you read the passage about uh, King David with Shalom, his son, the description is almost cinematographical. This is what uh, the uh, lazy uh, film critics would say. No, it's a tradition that comes from the Bible. If you read uh, Red and Black by Stendhal, the descriptions of the uh, battles by Stendhal and the horses galloping and the mud splashing and the guy that drops dead, 
there is always a, a literary uh, tradition that comes uh, from the visual that has been uh, forgotten. It was as if that tradition didn't matter, as if that tradition uh, was born with uh, cinema. Pio Barocha, one of my favorite writers, a great Basque. If you read La Mala Yerba, La Busca, The Tree of Science, the sun went down, Juan was walking along the path, uh, some uh, sheep uh, were grazing. It's all a description, as if it were a movie. So I don't uh, think that uh, movies have uh, influenced literature to a large extent. In some particular cases it has, but I think it's more a literary tradition that uh, dates back uh, 2,500 years. Before you mentioned the origin of uh, stories that stick in your mind and come back, and then in the development, uh, do you write with uh, a prior plan? Do you need... Uh, to have uh, your uh, story uh, completely set up before you start to write it, or is it a search process? No, it's all improvised. Uh, the Savage, uh, 700 pages, I had a vague idea of what the story was about, but I never know the end. I don't uh, put uh, post-its up, I don't have a plan. I write every day uh, what comes into my mind. And sometimes, and I've had jokes about this on Twitter, if it rains, it rains in the novel. I wrote on Twitter, uh, it's raining, let's see how this affects the novel. And uh, I was told I was uh, pedantic, but uh, it's uh, true. It was raining outside, so it was raining in the novel. If a dog barked, a dog barked. And uh, I include things that happen day to day without uh, trying to lose sight of where I am. There's something I wanted to talk about, and this um, might be uncomfortable. If it is uncomfortable, we can change the subject. It has to do with the controversy that everyone uh, knows about that uh, happened after uh, your collaboration with uh, González Iñárritu. And as I said earlier, for me, it's admirable uh, to have kept calm during that discussion, which uh, could put you in a very uncomfortable position as somebody with a lot of ego, etc., etc., and how uh, did that collaboration start and uh, what went wrong? Well, as I said, I plan to direct uh, this uh, trilogy. Alejandro uh, called me to write a uh, romantic comedy. And after two dinners, I said, uh, look, I'm very grateful for your offer, but uh, romantic comedies aren't my thing. And I don't write by commission. And he said, but I want to work with you. And I said, well, look, I'm writing this film that I'm going to uh, direct. Uh, uh, give it to me. No, it's mine. Give it to me. No, it's mine. I'm going to direct it. Then I said, OK, I'll give it to you with uh, one single condition, a gentleman's agreement. And he said, what is it? That it will be a film by both of us, like the uh, Cohen uh, brothers. If we're nominated, we'll both be nominated. If I'm against film buys, but if there is a film buy, it will be for both of us. The whole process will be for both of us. Perfect. I uh, wrote it believing that, and at the end he sued me uh, to take away the credit, and he threatened me. And uh, from there I said, well, uh, there was an agreement, because I'm not the kind that writes and hands over. I went through uh, uh, pre-production, uh, casting locations, uh, choosing uh, the music. I was present in the film. And uh, I thought that it was unfair. And uh, he had a bad cop that uh, came to threaten me. We'll do it this time, and we'll do it differently the next time. And uh, from there, uh, we broke. It's not that I believe that I'm the author of the film. As uh, was said in the media later on, that's false. What I believe is... Uh, that we can't say a film by when there are so many people involved. That's what I defended and what I still defend. Does it have to be a film directed by? I don't want to feel the author of Amores Perros. I'm uh, the author of uh, the screenplay and he made uh, the film, but I didn't work for him. So uh, the uh, sensation that was left was that I was his employee, which I think is completely unfair. And that was the uh, origin of the break. From the point uh, of uh, view of us who uh, share your trade, uh, we greatly appreciate uh, your position because it's not easy. 
Yes, uh, the fight was very much in the media. I think it's the first time I've spoken publicly about it. But uh, then he published a letter uh, about uh, everybody that had participated in Babel and saying that I felt that I was the only author. And uh, that's a lie. I should have answered that letter. I didn't feel the author. But I feel it's unfair that instead of uh, putting up the poster of the creators of Amores Perros, uh, he said the director of Amores Perros. And uh, hadn't we agreed that this was uh, a job done by both of us, that we were colleagues and workmates, and now it turns out uh, that you're uh, the only author. And that's how it started, because it was a very personal project. It was a trilogy I invented for me to direct, and I only accepted to hand it over, because it was my baby, it was my work. I would only accept if we did it together. And he said that 90% of the story was mine, and he had collaborated by 10%, and that it was the other way around in the film, because I collaborated, I uh, made notes, I was involved in all the processes, so I think it's unfair. In the end, after this collaboration, which was very fruitful and uh, uh, very friendly, that uh, in the end he said, all the credit's mine and all the prestige is mine, and uh, you're just like somebody that worked for me. Then you made a film with Tommy Lee Jones, and I believe that the experience was uh, completely different. Yes, with Tommy Lee. Tommy Lee called me one day. I was, happened to be in Los Angeles, and my mobile uh, went off, and he said, hello, I'm Tommy Lee Jones, I felt like saying, and I'm Bugs Bunny. But I had uh, already uh, said that to, to somebody, and the person on the other end was who they said they were. So I said, well, Tommy, uh, 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 how are you doing? And he said, uh, uh, bien, in Spanish, uh, do you speak English? And I felt like saying, no, but I said, yes, I uh, do speak English. I've read Amores Perros. Uh, I would like to talk about it. Could we have dinner? He came to have dinner at my house. Could I uh, work on it? But he's an actor I admire very much. I've always tried to uh, work with people that share my same taste. Not the same ideology, the same taste. So I asked Tommy what his taste is. And I said, who is your uh, living... Uh, uh, American uh, writer, if he says, uh, Ken uh, Follett, the uh, conversation is over. Uh, I'd say, thank you very much, uh, Tommy, and goodbye. And he said, McCartney, which is one of my favorites with Selwich, one of my favorite authors. And who's your favorite director? He said, uh, look behind you. And uh, I looked behind, and there was uh, a watercolor of a samurai. He said, that's part of the storyboard made by Kurosawa for Ram. Is it clear who my favorite director is? And then the uh, gold question, do you like hunting? If he turns out to be a vegetarian? He said, uh, yes, I love it. Let's make the film. He invited me to go hunting uh, on his ranch, an enormous ranch, uh, 140,000 hectares. Tommy Lee uh, sat on a hill. Uh, see over there, that's uh, half of my ranch, uh, 64 kilometers. Uh, and he said, uh, write uh, whatever you like. I'll do whatever you write. Okay. So uh, I wrote what I wanted. Uh, the Hunt, The Hunt has finally come out. Uh, on the uh, covers, you're defined as a hunter that writes. You use the, the Libes uh, phrase. Uh, tell me something about that passion. When I read that you were a hunter, I thought uh, you were a hunter with a typical image uh, with uh, the shotgun, but you uh, don't hunt that way. You hunt in a different way. I use my teeth, a bow and arrow. Tell us uh, about uh, the uh, importance of this for you and where does it come from? Since I was uh, three years old, I wanted to be a hunter. I had uh, an obsession with hunting and with women. I loved them when I was small, when you were three, when I was three. I wanted to be a hunter. I don't know where it comes from. 
They say uh, that uh, some of us have uh, Neanderthal genes. I probably do. But uh, uh, hunting has been uh, wrongly uh, denigrated. With sex, you can uh, rape a woman or you can make love. Uh, like uh, in hunting, there are hunters that massacre animals with no respect uh, and uh, there are others who uh, want to be integrated in nature and do it in the most difficult way and that's why I use a bow and arrow. We live in a society, I don't know here in Bilbao, but at least in the large cities in Mexico, United States and Latin America, we're further and further away from nature. Nature has elements of uh, tremendous uh, cruelty and uh, paradoxes. Hunting makes me feel I belong to nature. There are people that say, well, why don't you take pictures? Well, taking pictures is taking distance. It's not participating in the whole process of hunting. And then we live uh, in a very uh, alienated society. Nobody knows where things come from. We eat meat. We don't know where the meat comes from. We don't know how a cell phone is produced. We don't know how a plane flies. We don't know anything. At least by hunting, I uh, know where my food comes from because I don't kill animals I don't eat. It helps me study. It helps me understand prints. I can almost know uh, the uh, weight of a venison by the print. I know if it's uh, a male, a female, uh, what time this urine was passed. I know when they mate. I uh, know how long uh, their gestation lasts, uh, how big their litters are. But I don't uh, go uh, to kill animals. I go to hunt animals. It's different. If uh, I went to uh, kill animals, I'd kill uh, the first one I ran into. I go and uh, hunt uh, for an adult male uh, not under a certain weight, and I do it with a bow and arrow. And sometimes hunters that use a rifle walk and see a venison uh, 400 meters away, and then they lean against a tree and kill it. When I see a venison 400 uh, meters away, that's where uh, my hunting starts. And that means crawling for six hours until I'm 20 meters away from the venison. And in 99% of the cases or more, uh, the animal's going to get away. So uh, hunting has allowed me to uh, understand human nature. It's uh, helped me understand politics even. For example, sometimes you're hunting with a bow and arrow and you have to uh, be quiet and not move for hours. And the venison start to approach and first uh, the young females, then the young females uh, with uh, their babies, then a uh, very young uh, venison, and then those of a certain age, and then the uh, older animals. And in the end, uh, you see the big male you want to hunt uh, walking around for days. He doesn't uh, come close. And when he does come close, it's incredible how uh, all the other males uh, make way. And the females that were uh, running around uh, with the uh, little ones and uh, won't uh, let themselves be mounted, uh, practically uh, 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 grab uh, this big male's genitals. And this uh, management of power, of hierarchy, of uh, bullying, I've seen uh, females uh, uh, seriously uh, harm uh, other uh, little uh, venison because uh, they uh, try to eat on the same patch they were eating on. They trample on them. So that's why if an animal sees us, uh, they flee because they know that death is there. A mistake means death. And that has uh, allowed me to take this to literature and to uh, movies. It has allowed me uh, to look deeper into the contradictions of human people and better understand uh, human nature and understand that we're more nature than civilization. There's something else uh, that's in your films and uh, that you say is a source of influence, and that is the street. I imagine the street where you were born, where you grew up, uh, the streets of Mexico uh, City. What did those uh, streets uh, teach you? How was that uh, uh, growing up process? Well, first, I would like to say that there are many ways of uh, creating, many sources of creation. There are people that create based on other work, like Borges, who is a great, great, great writer of literature based on other books. Others use their own lives to describe things. And uh, I've tried to do it that way. 
I came uh, from La Unidad Modelo, a uh, lower middle class neighborhood, and I feel very fortunate to have grown up uh, there because a lot of things happened to me. And when I was growing up in 1968, and that's where the uh, novel comes in, The Savage, that's placed in that period and in that neighborhood, there was a left-wing uh, student movement that was very powerful that was repressed by the Mexican government uh, w with the army because the president uh, got scared. He thought that we were a chess piece in the Cold War between Russia and the United States and that that student uh, movement was infiltrated by the Russians, by the communists, and that it had to be stopped because the uh, Olympic Games were opening in two weeks. So he sent uh, the army and paramilitary forces they fired and tens and tens and tens of students were killed. But in order to maintain stronger control over those movements, there was what was called micro-repression. If you were playing on the street, some police uh, vehicles uh, came up, uh, the police uh, chased after you, and it doesn't, didn't matter how old you were, they put you in the police car or they'd uh, beat you or uh, shave your hair if you had long hair because it was uh, a sign of rebellion. And uh, we would uh, go up uh, on the roofs to avoid this. And uh, we did a lot of stuff on the roofs. Uh, people that went up on the roofs to get drunk, uh, played football on the roofs, uh, bred animals on the roofs, had sex on the roofs. Roofs became an important world. And then the street. There are people that don't have a street, and that can't be criticized. But uh, I uh, experienced uh, gratuitous violence as a child. Once we were playing baseball on the street, it had just rained, and we had uh, some uh, big sticks that we were uh, playing baseball with, and all of a sudden, out of nothing, I don't know why, I was 10 years old, a Vietnam veteran who lived there, tw a 25-year-old, uh, hit me. And uh, I was uh, pretty uh, plucky. And uh, I threatened him with a stick. He took the stick away uh, from him and beat me up with it. I n never knew why. And uh, I tried to run away, and he hit me on the back of my neck. And I fell down and couldn't move. And uh, they thought I was going to be uh, paraplegic, but I recovered. But I still don't know why he beat me up. And I remember my friends were crying. Uh, they thought uh, he'd kill me. I couldn't move. I could only move my neck. It's a very uh, terrifying experience not to be able to move more than your neck. And uh, then he got scared, and when he uh, bent down, I bit him. That was the only thing I could do. The only thing I could do was bite him, and I bit him. And uh, another time, when I was eight, I felt very feverish. Uh, I went out into the sunshine, and some uh, 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 guys, some 20-odd uh, years old, came up and said, Oh, you're sick. We're going to cure you. They started burning my shirt with cigarette ends. And more problems. Until I got accustomed to uh, keeping a knife up my sleeve. I started to do that when I was 11. And I learned to pull it out very quickly. And next time somebody tries to beat me up, I'm going to kill them, I thought. And in fact, I went to school with a knife. A private school. And I remembered a fat bully came up to me. I spoke with a northern accent uh, and uh, he pushed me off the stage uh, and in the classroom I fell and I pulled my uh, knife out and uh, uh, put it to his neck and I said you're going to die and he got really scared and uh, my schoolmate said uh, you're going to get expelled and I said uh, yes but he's going to die first but I didn't kill him. I was thinking uh, of uh, the uh, film students and scriptwriter students uh, that often ask, well, what am I going to write about if nothing's ever happened to me? And if they're listening here, uh, they'll say, uh, well, uh, look at everything that has to happen to me so that I can uh, write stories. Well, I haven't told you everything yet. Well, we'll continue that during part two. But do you think that to write uh, scripts, uh, it has to have happened to you? Or novels or stories? No. I think uh, Borges lost his virginity when he was about 50. Seriously, it's no joke. Borges, unlike Adolfo Luis Casares, uh, who, uh, it was a miracle, didn't screw his own tennis racket, Borges was a very shy uh, guy. 
And that's what they say, but it doesn't matter. He wrote great works based uh, on the library. Jane Austen wrote her masterpieces about how boring it is to be a Victorian woman and to wait for a young man to uh, come up to you to marry you. And uh, their master works. I'm uh, a great admirer of uh, an American film, Duck Season. Two kids, 12 or 13 years old, get together to uh, uh, play the Nintendo game. I don't know if you remember it, Duck Season. And uh, the light goes out, and all uh, they can do is talk to each other. And it's a masterpiece. So you don't necessarily need street life. It helped me to have street life, and I belong to this literary tradition. And uh, hunting has also helped me. I've had things that have happened to me during hunting. Once I was following a deer, and I decided to uh, sleep uh, on the mountainside. And uh, the next day, I was uh, covered with uh, insects and uh, inside my ears, my nose, my uh, mouth. I was covered uh, in ticks. Another time, I was hunting geese uh, four below zero. I uh, got in the water, and all of a sudden, I said, I'm feeling sleepy. I'm going to sleep. And I said, oh, don't go to sleep. You've got hypothermia. You're going to die. And just thinking about uh, walking a kilometer with the water up to my neck, I said, no, I'm not going to make it. The headache, because uh, all the blood goes uh, to the brain. It goes to all the organs. And uh, that headache uh, lasted for months as if I'd been beaten on the head with a baseball bat. Those experiences are helpful to me. And hunting is also useful to have this kind of experience. But uh, if uh, a young person doesn't have those experiences, they can talk about their own reality. You've been a teacher for a long time. You've taught a great deal. Is it possible to teach a script writing, movie making? What can be taught and what cannot be taught? Well, what a young person doesn't understand at university is that the most valuable thing is the space uh, for reflection and dialogue in the classroom. It's not just the teacher. The teacher should provoke dialogue. And the most important experience that a young person is going to have at university is the dialogue they're going to have with their colleagues. That's uh, where things really happen. And a writer that wants to uh, teach people to write has to just provide the tools. If the writer has an interior world, those tools are going to work. If they don't have an interior world, they're not going to work. That's why I always said to my students, never write trying to be profound. Uh, forget about being profound. That's not useful. Tell a story. If you're profound people, the story is going to be profound. If you're superficial people, the story is going to be superficial. But uh, why say write something uh, profound? That. Uh, hurt students a great deal, because they, if they write something uh, silly, well, uh, uh, great, silly things are also literature. It doesn't all have to be very profound. And sometimes uh, uh, they want to uh, confront me with those that write uh, light romantic uh, comedy in my uh, country. Uh, why do you see this film? Perfect, I love it. Why do I love it? Because sometimes those films that make a lot of money in uh, Mexican movies uh, make it possible to make films like the ones I make. And why should I denigrate somebody that uh, uh, does cinema different to mine? We've spoken about uh, Guillermo, the uh, author of uh, movie scripts, and uh, uh, you've uh, been a director and co-scriptwriter and director that won a uh, uh, prize in Venice, I believe. Why did you start to direct? Because you're uh, tired of uh, others uh, uh, fiddling uh, with your stuff? No, I'm like a girl on the subway. I don't mind being fiddled with. No, well, I do mind. What I feel is that you uh, live a very uh, lonely life and sometimes uh, you say I want to come out of this I uh, wrote a film that was called The Night Buffalo I hired a director and it was a failure it was considered to be the world's worst film in Mexico 
Although uh, there's a cult side in France, it was uh, voted the best cult film, which I couldn't understand, in France, and I hired the director. I've always worked with leading directors. All the films I've made have been with leading directors, including myself. And uh, Tommy Lee Jones in uh, Alejandro's first film and Lorenzo's first film. And when I saw Jorge, I said, I can do this better than him. But I don't know about lenses. I haven't studied uh, filmmaking and I haven't done advertising or video clips. And once walking down Cancun, I saw a T-shirt about Einstein that said, imagination is more important than knowledge. So I'm going to direct. Why not? I said, I'm going to direct. I'd sold Burning Plane uh, very well. It had, was my record. And I said to uh, the uh, producer, no way. And I said, give me an opportunity. If you can uh, convince uh, an actress like uh, Cherise uh, Theron, uh, we'll go ahead. And I convinced the blonde. And once I convinced uh, the blonde, and you convinced another blonde, Kim Bassinger, and you discovered another one, Jennifer Lawrence. Her first film was uh, uh, yours. Jennifer Lawrence, let me uh, say something about this. I didn't have a work permit and uh, I couldn't uh, work in the United States. So the casting director uh, would send me DVDs and uh, she'd send me the DVDs of the first uh, day. Six actresses came. These are the first six. I recommend uh, the second one. And uh, these are the boys. Uh, I recommend so-and-so and I don't recommend so-and-so. And I saw the DVD and uh, not the second one, the third one. I said, what's this? But what's this? I was really impressed uh, and I watched it over and over again. Uh, I said, she's fantastic. I spoke uh, to a friend of mine, Mad Rodriguez Lockith, who did the uh, film for the movie. And uh, if you don't know him, you should. He leads a band called The Drive-In. He's considered a new Jimi Hendrix. He plays the guitar like uh, no one else. And I said, look at this. And he said, it's wonderful. And I spoke uh, to the casting director and I said, I want the actress Jennifer Lawrence. Are you sure? It's the first day of casting. Uh, you have a month that you're going to see like 300 actresses. I'll never find a better one. Hire her. I got a call from Charlize, who was also a producer. And she said, uh, what are you doing? It's obvious how green you are. Uh, experienced directors uh, look uh, at all the actors and then choose. What Charlize didn't know is that in The Night Buffalo, the director was very insecure, and we saw, and it wasn't false, between six and 7,000 actors and actresses. Actors from Colombia, Argentina, Mexico, Tijuana, Puebla, Veracruz. We saw prostitutes real prostitutes to see if they could work as actresses. We saw people from Tucson and New York, Phoenix. So I became uh, a casting expert and I know when an actor is good. And Jennifer Lawrence acts in the film with, uh, at 17 years of age. And it's impressive watching uh, Jennifer Lawrence act at this distance uh, gives you goose pimples. I chose J.D. Pardo and uh, Jennifer Lawrence, but uh, I didn't know how uh, they would look on the screen, whether there would be any chemistry between them. And I don't know whether you've gone to a casting session. Uh, usually they're done almost in a garage. It's very cold. We were recording it and we said, keep improvising. And all of a sudden I started to hear strange noises uh, next to me, like What's that noise? I'm watching the actors. Who's going? And I turned round and the casting director and her assistant were crying, crying. That's how moved they were. And the casting director, uh, Debbie Sen, who's a legend in Hollywood, and said, The gods of casting have descended here. Stop crying. If they can do this here, what uh, won't they do on the screen? When we finished the film, I wrote a letter to Jennifer. I said, look, Jennifer, don't say you haven't been warned. 
You're going to be as nominated as Meryl Streep, and you're going to win as many Oscars as Meryl Streep. You're going to be hyper-famous. You're going to be the most famous in your generation. You're going to be the most uh, famous uh, actress uh, from the beginning of the century. Uh, get ready. And she said, yeah, well, hello. Get ready. Guillermo, I think uh, that uh, we have to move over to uh, questions from the audience, but one final question. Uh, what are we going to see from you next? What film? Uh, what script? Uh, what uh, film are you going to direct? Uh, what new are you working on? Well, uh, for the time being, I'm having a lot of fun as a film producer, because as a film producer, that doesn't take a lot of work. And I can back uh, films I like. So I'm producing films in Brazil, in India, in Turkey, in the United States, and in Mexico. First films? No, not all the time. Obviously, I want to direct. I have some uh, offers to direct, and I want to write another uh, novel. And I enjoyed coming to Bilbao to present this one. It's nice. The response to uh, The Savage has been uh, very good. It's in its uh, third edition here in Spain in only three months. So, uh, yes, uh, writing novels is uh, bringing a lot to me, and I've had uh, offers in the U.S. Uh, to write TV series. Uh, I was linked uh, to TV, and it's very really difficult to uh, write series. Uh, uh, there are a lot of opinions. We didn't uh, comment it earlier, but... Uh, during uh, the North American TV uh, series booms, uh, the uh, script writers, the authors of the text, uh, were the owners. They had the credit. In Breaking Bad, for example, nobody uh, talks about uh, the director. Everybody says uh, Vince Gilligan's Breaking Bad. The same with The Wire. Yes, and why is the writer the boss on TV and not in the cinema? It said, well, things are changing. Uh, the producers are sharpening uh, their nails. The producers are trying to take that power away. Well, let's see if we uh, let them. Uh, Scriptwriters are about to launch a strike in the US. Well, we can't see very much, so I don't know uh, who has any questions. Although I know most of you came to see Carrier. Uh, let me uh, take a picture to uh, show them in Mexico that uh, I have uh, followers. It looks very impressive from here. I know how Cristiano Ronaldo feels now. Are there any questions over there? Guillermo has just come from Brazil and he says that he was asked questions for 12 hours. Uh, uh, let's not say that there aren't uh, any uh, questions in Bilbao. I can speak uh, Brazilian or uh, Galician. Don't ask me to speak Basque. Uh, my name's Arriaga, but uh, I'm not good at Basque. No questions? Rio de Janeiro is going to win. Well, I'll ask another question. The title uh, of the series uh, was uh, Today's Society. You come from Mexico. Since the new uh, North American president and the threat of the wall and so on, what are the circumstances? How is that seen over there? Is there a perception that things are changing? You also said uh, at uh, one point uh, that the conflict uh, in playwriting uh, comes about when there's a break in the balance. Do you think that break in the balance can be really dangerous? Well, look, to start with, there's something we need to understand. Who is Trump talking to? Because one thing is the discourse and something else is uh, the action. Trump is talking to what they call the hard voter base on the one hand. That's the people that want to listen to this discourse. He wants to bring uh, negotiation techniques uh, used in the world of real estate to politics and he's uh, threatened to uh, take the United States out of the free trade agreement. And he said, it's the worst agreement ever made. Of course, uh, the United States imposed it on Mexico. They put pressure. And now it turns out that uh, the
the uh, Mexicans were taking advantage of uh, the gringos, as if uh, we'd stolen half of their territory and they did steal half of ours. Marx uh, said that the working class would rebel against capitalism. And today the working class is rebelling against uh, capitalism, but it hasn't been the left that has obtained the votes, but unfortunately the ultra-right, Le Pen, because Trump's base is the American working class. Now, threats against Mexico, hard facts. Mexico is the second uh, trade partner of the United States. Nobody buys more from the United States than Mexico. Hard fact. Mexico sends more uh, tourists than China, Japan, France, Italy, and Spain. If Mexico stops sending tourists, the American economy will collapse. Third, the most pro-Trump counties, Iowa, Kansas, etc., etc., it uh, happens uh, to uh, sell their uh, maize and wheat to who? To Mexico. If uh, Mexico decides not to buy uh, U.S. Uh, maize and wheat, we will uh, break Trump's base. We will make them go broke. And there's a motion from a Mexican senator to buy uh, from Argentina and Brazil, their friends. Why uh, buy from the United States? And then uh, let's see if they uh, vote against Mexico. And who's going to build the wall? Mexico. No. They imposed uh, globalization. It's curious. The two countries that imposed globalization, with Reagan and Thatcher, that pushed uh, the famous Reaganomics and the Thatcher politics, are the first uh, two countries to repent because their working class here suddenly said, what happened? They're making millions, which is also true. I'd like to say something about the border. I think it's important. Why was the border uh, suddenly filled with drug trafficking and why were there so many migrants on the border? One of the key moments was the free trade agreement. I saw it uh, with uh, Estrada, uh, Lucio and Pedro, who are friends of mine, illiterate uh, farm workers from Mexico. These uh, peasants uh, have no way of competing against the powerful American agricultural industry. In a matter of months, uh, they became impoverished. And in fact, because I saw it, I saw it, I didn't read about it in a book, I saw it. They had uh, a uh, record uh, crop, but... They couldn't uh, afford uh, to uh, buy the uh, seed to re -sow when they sold the crop because the Americans came in with their uh, subsidized crop and uh, American farms became a place with no opportunities. And uh, what was the choice? Uh, go to a city, starve to death, uh, start uh, drug trafficking or emigrate. Why is there drug trafficking in Mexico? It has to do with historic moments, a historic moment that seems important to me is that the United States uh, dedicating itself uh, to uh, cancelling the cocaine routes between Colombia, Miami, Puerto Rico, and the east of the United States. They wiped them out. And uh, they destroyed the Medellin and Cali cartels, etc., etc. What did the uh, Colombian narcos do? Uh, Miami is closed. Let's take it through Mexico. And uh, let's uh, deal through Mexico. And Mexico became not only a marijuana exporter, which it was, but also a cocaine. The uh, other aspect is uh, that uh, the drug dealers are very intelligent uh, to find uh, a way where there's uh, a power vacuum. And when we lost the elections in 2000, in that uh, transition with uh, the uh, new government, and there were uh, power vacuums uh, that the uh, drug dealers uh, immediately took over. So they are historic uh, moments. And uh, I don't mean to say that the party that came into power uh, promoted this. But uh, uh, it has to be understood that during that uh, two, three year uh, period without a government, these people uh, took uh, over power. Plus uh, the uh, traditional uh, drug channels that were obliterated. And then another fundamental fact uh, was 9-11. 9-11 created a different relationship.
relationship between Mexico and the United States. And uh, from there, things have changed. But on the other hand, with the signing of the uh, TLC, the idea that capital will always emigrate to where it finds work, better working conditions to uh, make its products. A worker in Mexico, and I know this because I know uh, people that work at the plants, a not highly specialized uh, worker in Mexico, my friend Murieta, for example, makes $200 a month. $200 is uh, practically what a worker makes in the United States per day. So if Trump breaks the free trade agreement, the American products will get more expensive. It will uh, create a very unstable uh, country in the South. It's going to be a disaster. It's going to be a disaster. He knows it's going to cause a disaster. His people know it's going to cause a disaster. If he continues uh, to make threats, the Mexican people is uh, pressing the uh, president to say, uh, next time uh, there's a threat, no more free trade agreement. Let's welcome China. Bring China over here and let's see how we can get on. Uh, that's, that's enough with the threats. We're like the ugly duckling. And all because uh, Trump had tried to do business in Mexico. They didn't work. He got very upset and now he hates us and he wants to ruin the country because he has a personal uh, problem with Mexico. So you don't believe that the corruption of the previous uh, political parties uh, brought about this uh, poverty, the uh, insecurity, the uh, murders in Suarez, uh, the uh, assassination of women, and also certain permissive policies. No, of course I believe it, and I've said it in all the interviews. The great disease of Mexico is uh, corruption and impunity. That's the poison in this country. I'm talking about historic moments that determine the relationship with the United States. It's a, a disgrace, but it hurts in Argentina, Brazil. We've all been punished by this. No, corruption in Mexico, obviously. Well, look, I uh, go to a state called Coahuila in northern Mexico, where the state was uh, completely uh, dominated by the Zetas. When the Zetas uh, broke the pact and killed uh, the son of the uh, former governor, in one week they had killed the leader of the Zetas, imprisoned the others, as soon as the Mexican state, that's far enough. That's as far as it went. And uh, a pol politician uh, said to me, there's no uh, drug trafficking without the collusion of power. But uh, I, the uh, Yankees always want me uh, to make uh, films about Mexican cartels. And uh, I said, you know, I think that the American cartels are much more interesting. Hard facts. At Ciudad Juarez, there was I don't know how many people killed in one year, probably 7,000 for 80 tons of cocaine. Of those uh, 80 uh, tons, 79 and a half go over to uh, Texas. Do you know how many people uh, died in El Paso, Texas during that same time? One. Why do we Mexicans provide the dead? One kilo of cocaine on the border. One ki no, sorry, one kilo of cocaine from the border to Washington, D.C., and this is our study from the Washington Post, uh, increases its value between 7 to 12 times. And as we say to the Yanks, uh, where are the real cartels? But here in Bilbao and other cities uh, in Europe, they ask me, uh, Mexico is a horror of violence. No, it's not a horror of violence. We have the best publicists in the world, the drug dealers. Of course, uh, I uh, hang uh, three guys off a bridge and take pictures. Well, that gets around. But hard facts, in Mexico there are 13 uh, dead per uh, 100,000 inhabitants. How many do you think there are in Detroit? Look it up on Google. Memphis, uh, St. Louis, Missouri. So, something's happening in the United States where uh, the value of drugs goes up 12 times. We're talking about 50, 100 million dollars. Who keeps that difference? I'm not saying it's not corruption. Don't misunderstand me. That left you feeling very cheerful. We could 
tell some jokes. Good evening. I was lucky enough to uh, listen to you uh, last week in Madrid. I was very interested in your experience. Uh, my attention was very much uh, drawn uh, to the image of the venison and the power of the alpha male in the group. And today with the issue of politics, uh, it's as if uh, force is winning over intelligence. So the case of Trump, uh, Le Pen, or the case of Venezuela, which is my country and is going through very difficult times. What uh, would your thoughts be about uh, that point, the relationship between uh, force and intelligence in today's politics? We have to recognize something in Trump, and we have to recognize it because it needs to be recognized. The guy knew how to exploit the needs of uh, a social uh, class uh, that was hurting, offended, because they'd had a back president, displaced, because many of the jobs went to Mexico and China, and angry because of the political corruption. And I can say this as a hunter. In the United States, uh, there are close to 40 million hunters, and they're tired of the uh, Democrats trying to uh, take their rifles away from them, banning, hunting, uh, being criticized by them. Uh, this uh, candidate has uh, children that hunt. I'll vote for him, really. I uh, saw it on Hunter TV channels. Don't vote for Hillary, don't vote for Hillary, don't vote for Hillary. And they were uh, Democrat voters, uh, but they voted for Trump because of the difficulties of political correctness. But uh, if you look at the animals, you know that uh, animals can impose their will by a brute force through bullying. And one of Trump's characteristics is disqualifying uh, the other uh, person by uh, feeling fierce. And he doesn't ca care about lying. I tell a lie, I feel embarrassed, I feel guilty. Trump doesn't care about lying as long as he can impose his strength that way. And uh, there is something about an alpha male in Trump that has uh, worked for him. But it's not going to work much longer. Because there are other alpha males. Well, there are. There are other alpha males in the world. Uh, what do you think? I'm the president of the United States and that's it. Uh, well, uh, wait for uh, North Korea to go crazy. Or for Iran to go uh, crazy. Or uh, for Putin to turn things around. Any more questions? I have to confess that uh, I'm a bit lazy when it comes to reading. So when you said 700 pages, I'm more visual. And I prefer uh, you to uh, tell me what you think through pictures. I couldn't forget when you, you were talking about the border. I still remember the three deaths of Melquiades Ochoa. That's where you reflect the border, isn't it? There's the coming and going. And uh, my question is, were the three deaths uh, on purpose? Or is it that you want to uh, tell something else? That film, uh, for me, also uh, meant a break with Iñárritu and uh, meant uh, the liberation of Arriaga as an independent. I don't know, these are two points. Well, uh, the uh, three burials of Melchiades Estrada, and I already said it, Melchiades Estrada uh, exists. He's my friend. He's alive, he's not dead. And uh, all the Estradas are in the novel. I live this first hand because they're very good friends of mine, the Estrada family. I've uh, lived at first hand what it means to uh, emigrate. Emigrate because you have no choice. Lucio's son, 
my godson Pedro went with the other Pedro when they were 15 and uh, we didn't see them again until they were 32 do you know what it means not to see your son for that long 17 years and now there are cell phones but when these people left there was nothing Rosa Pedro's wife uh, went across the river and disappeared she was uh, never heard from again and Pedro said I'm not going to cut my hair until she turns up and he cried every day because he missed her a lot it was his wife and one day she turned up and uh, he said what happened well being uh, a migrant uh, isn't a crime but trying uh, to uh, cross with a false passport is and I was taken to prison and I was allowed one call and when I made the call because they didn't have a phone then but when I uh, phoned uh, I said I want to talk to Lucio well they had to uh, go by a bike for one hour to find Lucio and the call was only three minutes I want to talk to Lucio uh, tell him I want to talk to him and that was the end of it and uh, uh, she thought that uh, she could wait until uh, Lucio got back on the phone so I wanted to portray this world of migration I wanted to create uh, empathy I wanted an American to feel what it is to travel in the other direction I've always tried to get Americans to see uh, the problem of migration from a different perspective I did it in Babel I don't know whether you saw Babel but in uh, Babel the uh, nanny loses the children in the desert do you know how many dead children have been found in the desert sometimes uh, the uh, parents go they give uh, uh, what they call a coyote uh, money uh, to uh, take uh, the kids over later we're talking about babies or toddlers or children one or two years old uh, but uh, they take them to the border and uh, drop them there and run off so there are dozens of uh, children in orphanages that have parents but nobody knows who they are you know what it is for a parent to suddenly realize that you left your child in the desert and don't know what happened to them I try to reflect that through uh, a process of empathy to make them understand that migration isn't uh, something you do because you want to it's because you have no choice and that's why I wrote the uh, three uh, burials of Melchiades but the three uh, burials were a bit of a satire between uh, my work in uh, the movies and in my novels I think there are uh, encounter points uh, communicating vessels and the three burials are uh, based on a sweet uh, a taste of death and Amoris uh, Peros are based on a 501 and the savage they're the same communicating vessels well if there are no more questions uh, we can uh, go to the book signing and meet outside thank you very much